press record. There you go. And now, of course, uh, James and the Giant Peach moves, so I have to go find it. Chapter 30. They all raised their heads again. Shh, there it is again. But the voice was too far away from them to hear what it was saying. It's, it's a cloud, man. I just know it's a cloud, man. They're, they're after us again. It came from above, the earthworm said, and automatically everybody looked upward, everybody except the centipede who couldn't move. Ouch, they said, help, have mercy, we're going to catch it this time. For what they saw now, swirling and twisting directly above their heads, was an immense black cloud, a terrible, dangerous, thundery looking thing that began to rumble and roar even as they were staring at it. And then from high up on the top of the cloud, the faraway voice came down to them once again, this time very loud and very clear. On with the faucets, on with the faucets, on with the faucets. Three seconds later, the hole underneath of the cloud seemed to split and burst open like a paper bag, and then out came the water. They saw it coming. It was quite easy to see because it wasn't just raindrops. It, was, it wasn't raindrops at all. It was a great solid mass of water that might you, you would see at a lake or a whole ocean dropping out of the sky on top of them. And down it came, down, 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 crashing first onto the seagulls and then onto the peach itself while the poor travelers shrieked with fear and groped around frantically for something to catch hold of. The peach stem, the silk strings, anything they could find. And all the time the water came pouring and roaring down upon them, bouncing and smashing and sloshing and slashing and swashing and swirling and surging and whirling and gurgling and gushing and rushing and rushing. And it was like being pinned down underneath the biggest waterfall in the world and not being able to get out. They couldn't speak, they couldn't see, they couldn't breathe. And James Henry Trotter, holding on madly to one of the silk screens above the peach stem, told himself that this might surely be the end of everything at last. But then just as suddenly as it had started, the deluge stopped. They were out of it and it was all over. The wonderful seagulls had flown right through it and come out safely on the other side. Once again, the giant peach was sailing peacefully through the mysterious moonlit sky. I am drowned, gasped the old green grasshopper, spitting out water by the pint. It's gone right through my skin. I always thought my skin was waterproof, but it isn't. And now I'm full of rain. Look at me, look at me. It's washed me clean. The paint's all gone. I can move again. That's the worst news I've heard in a long time. The centipede was dancing around the deck and turning somersaults in the air and singing, of course, at the top of his voice. Oh, hooray for the storm of the rain. I can move, I don't feel any pain. And now I'm a pest. I'm the biggest and best, the most marvelous pest once again. Oh, do shut up, the old green grasshopper said. Look at me, look at me, I'm freed, I'm freed. Not a scratch, not a bruise, not a bleed. To his grave, this fine gent, they all thought they had sent, and, and very near went, and very near went, but they can't quite the wrong centipede. Chapter 31. So the centipede got out of it. Good for him. He's annoying, but he's fun. How fast are we? How, how fast we're going all of a sudden? I wonder why. I don't think the seagulls like this place any better than we do. I imagine they want to get out of it as soon as they can. They got a bad fright in the storm we've just been through. Faster and faster flew the seagulls, skimming across the sky at a tremendous pace, with the peach trailing out behind them. Cloud after cloud went by on either side all of them ghostly white in the moonlight, and several more times during the night, the travelers caught glimpses of cloud men moving around in the tops of these clouds, working their sinister magic upon the world below. Once they passed a snow machine in operation, with the cloud men turning the handle in a blizzard of snowflakes blowing out of the great funnel above, they saw the huge drums that were used for making thunder, and the cloud men beating them furiously with long hammers. They saw the frost factories and the wind producers and the places where cyclones and tornadoes were manufactured and sent spinning down toward the earth. And once deep in the hollow of a large billowy cloud, they spotted something that could only have been a cloud men city. There were caves everywhere running into the cloud. And at the entrances to the caves, the cloud men's wives were crouching over little stoves with frying pans in their hands, frying snowballs for their husband's suppers and hundreds of cloud men's children were frisking about all over the place and shrieking with laughter and sliding down the billows of the cloud on toboggans. An hour later, just before dawn, the travelers heard a soft whooshing noise above their heads 
and they glanced up and saw an immense gray bat-like creature swooping down towards them out of the dark. It circled around and around the peach, flapping its great wings slowly in the moonlight and staring at the travelers. Then it uttered a series of long, deep, melancholy cries and flew off again into the night. Oh, I do wish the morning would come, the spider said, shivering all over. It won't be long now. Look, it's getting lighter over there already. They all sat in silence, watching the sun as it came up slowly over the rim of the horizon for a new day. There's that strange creature. Chapter 32. And when full daylight came at last, they all got to their feet and stretched their poor cramped bodies. And then the centipede, who always seemed to see things first, shouted, look, there's land below. He's right, they cried, running to the edge of the peach and peering over. Hooray, hooray, it looks like streets and houses, but how enormous it all is. A vast city, glistening in the early morning sunshine, lay spread out 3,000 feet below them. And at that height, the cars were like little beetles crawling along the streets, and people walking on the pavements looked no larger than tiny grains of soot. But what tremendous tall buildings. I've never seen anything like them before in England. Which town do you think this is? This couldn't possibly be England. Then where is it? You know what those buildings are? shouted James, jumping up and down with excitement. Those are skyscrapers. Th th this must be America, and that, my friend, means that we have crossed the Atlantic Ocean overnight. You don't mean it. It's not possible. It's incredible. It's unbelievable. Oh, I've always dreamed of going to America. I had a friend once who... Be quiet. Who cares about your friend? The thing we've got to think about now is how on earth are we going to get down to Earth? Ask James. I don't think that should be so difficult, James told them. All we have to do is cut loose a few seagulls. Not too many, mind you, but just enough so that the others can't quite keep us up in the air. Then down we shall go, slowly and gently, until we reach the ground. Set a people bite through the strings for us, one at a time. Stop the share. Boom, ba -doom. That was three chapters, three very quick chapters. We will be finishing up this book this week, and then we'll have one more three-week period where we'll start a whole new book, and don't ask me what that book is yet. I have around five from which to choose. Maybe I'll put it up there for you guys to vote on. I just might do that. So let's take a look at our daily assignment. And then we'll hear from the three people that are to be sharing. Here we go. And let's bring this up here. Okay, some pretty straightforward questions today. Um, who was the only one happy with the deluge of rain and why? Flying past through the night, what did James and his companions see? Once full daylight came, what did they see? Where does James realize they are? And how are they going to get down? So if you were paying attention to the reading, great. If you weren't, you can watch the recording and you can look down at the end of this document. Moving down, please be reviewing your poetry words. There will be a vocabulary test this Friday. Once again, we have the editing of the Crazy Horse Monument. If you haven't seen that video yet, it's pretty cool. Uh, for your poetry, on your poetry, let's get a little closer view of this. I created, I don't know if you guys saw this, you should have seen it, I posted it in Teams. I did examples of couplets and quains, haikus, limerick, quatrain, free verse, an acrostic poem, a list poem, terse verse, and rhythm poem. Now, there are many more types of poems than just these. So if you have a book and you wrote a poem that's not a poem that are one of these, that's fine. You just have to have five different kinds of poems, and then you have to tell us what kinds they are and do the other things that are listed. But this should give you a good idea, and I had fun writing those. I especially like this one, because I did have a cousin like this. And a friend, too. My cousin is so fond of lying. To tell the truth, he gave up trying. Ever have one of those friends that you couldn't believe a word they said because they were constantly exaggerating everything? Hyperbole? They were masters of hyperbole. By the way, that's a poetry term, isn't it? Hyperbole. Verb tenses in English. Now, the thing is with grammar, as I've told you, Grammar has all kinds of really 
kind of bizarre words. And students get all flustered by the words. And here we have, gosh, you guys are so big, I can't even scroll here. Let me make this a little smaller. That might things a little bit. Uh, the words like future simple, future perfect, future continuous, present perfect continuous, those are just grammar terms. The meanings are not difficult. It's all about putting your action in the time period you want. And there's all kinds of examples. So I just took the examples here and I made my own. You can do the same with any action verb. And you can see just by adding different helping verbs and different uh, endings to the verb, you can make the time period wherever you want it to be. I, I love this one. I will have been cooking dinner. By the time you get home, I will have been cooking dinner for two hours. Thanks for coming home and eating it. So that's the verb tenses. But again, don't get all worried about these words. They're not as important as knowing that you can put your time and your action whenever you want it to be. That's the most important thing with verb tenses. And then sticking with that verb tense because you don't want to switch back and forth where you're talking about the past, then you're going into the future, then you're going into the present, and then you're going to a different tense. It really gets confusing for people. You've got your uh, po poetry portfolio, which is due at the end of this week. And again, some people ask me about artistic expression of the poem, and I've been answering uh, just anything you want it to be. You can illustrate it. You can take pictures and post it with your poem. You can perform it on Zoom. You can put music to it. If you got a really strong rhythm, you can put music to it. You can put a beat to it and make it like rap or hip hop. Uh, it's up to you how you express it creatively. I don't wanna tell you how to do that. I want you to choose. Now, uh, the Rebus word puzzles are really cool. I listed all kinds of those right here. So I want you to continue doing those. They really stretch your mind. Beautiful mountains today for you to enjoy. Uh, family fun. Do you guys have a household signal? When I was a kid uh, and we had to go somewhere, we were always sure it was time to go as soon as we heard my dad jingle jangle his keys. When you heard those keys jangling, you better be ready to go out the door. So that was the household signal that it was time to go. No more delays, no more anything. Get in the car. So maybe you have a signal like that. I bet you do. And mountain goats, and then James and the Giant Peach again. So let's close this share out. And let's see who is ready. I got to look at something really quick here to remind me who is up today. Cheyenne, Eli, and Graham. Uh, before we get into that, let's see. Let's see who's here. Is Graham here? Graham is here. Is Cheyenne here? She checked in on Teams. Who was the other person? Eli. Is Eli here? I don't see Eli either. So Graham, you're up. Let me unmute you. And what do you have to share from the long ago and far away? Um, I'm going to share my favorite part. Oh, good. My favorite part of the book was the chariot race when the green chariot won. When they did the chariot race? What did you like about it? Like how they were aggressive. Yeah. Do you know uh, if you if you want to see some really cool Hollywood versions of chariot racing, there's uh, there's a couple really great movies from the fifties. One of them's called Ben Hur, and it has one of the most excited, exciting chariot scenes ever filmed. It's rather it's rather gruesome. But it's old style gruesome, so you can handle it. It's from the 1950s. Uh, anything else, Graham? Um, do you want me to share something else? I don't know. Did you have anything else to share from that book? Mm, I have the whole thing right here. Okay. 
Well, if you shared your most exciting part, that was the most exciting part. I'm going to stop this recording.